Sports Illustrated magazine was founded in 1954, an era when sexism was rampant. Women were limited in educational and career opportunities. There is truth to the archetype of the bored housewife with a fake smile, baking cookies in between popping mother's little helpers. So I'm not about to romanticize the 1950s as a great time for women. But the specific kind of sexualized objectification of women that we see today was not present at that time. Sports Illustrated magazine is representative of how portrayals of women in the media have evolved from then to now. In the first 10 years of the magazine, pre-swimsuit issue, women athletes appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated over 12% of the time. These wholesome covers portrayed women not as objects, but as actualized, active individuals competing or enjoying leisure activities. The covers featured women golfing, ice skating, skiing, horseback riding, and swimming. Although the women are good looking and made up, these covers don't feel overtly like they're for the male gaze. Instead, these women are role models, celebrated for their achievements rather than their appearances. In 1964, Sports Illustrated shifted its portrayal of women, and this corresponds to an overall societal shift in women's roles. The early 60s saw a genesis of the women's liberation movement, and along with it, women's sexual liberation. In 1961, the contraceptive pill was introduced, which on the surface seemed to allow women to improve their bodily autonomy. But like with all things, Men saw women's newfound sexual freedom as something that they could exploit. And so at this time, the hypersexualization of women in the media took off. Because the men in power who controlled the media, including print magazines like Sports Illustrated, saw that if they could condition women to see themselves as sex objects and then act accordingly, men would benefit. And now, without the added danger of having to take responsibility for a pregnancy. So, in 1964, we see a shift in the portrayal of women in Sports Illustrated from the wholesome faces of the past to imagery like this. Women in false eyelashes and the largest hair I've ever seen, completely impractical for running, of course, getting ready to sprint right into your bed. And of course, 1964 also saw the emergence of the now iconic swimsuit issue. The first swimsuit issue was a five-page supplement that had this as its cover, which is fairly wholesome by today's standards, but still designed with the sole purpose of appealing to the male gaze. We are looking at an object, a doll, not an action figure, a model, not an athlete. This trend continued, and from a female empowerment standpoint, the magazine went downhill. In fact, some academics in 2013 analyzed women's representation on the cover of Sports Illustrated in the early 2000s and found that excluding the swimsuit editions, only 4.9% of covers featured women athletes a significant decrease from the 12% of the early issues. But while women's representation as empowered athletes diminished, women's representation as sex objects skyrocketed. In the days before internet pornography became so widely available, the swimsuit edition thrived. This issue typically sells about 10 to 15 times as many copies as a regular issue of the magazine, generating around $7 million in newsstand revenue and about $35 million in advertising. Selling women as sex objects is extremely popular and very lucrative. This year we have something new and not so new. For the first time, a man is posing on the cover of the swimsuit edition. This is Lena Bloom. And when I saw this story, my knee-jerk reaction was, good, let men have this. Let men be objectified by other men. That job has fallen on women for too long. Let men be titillated by pictures of men. Leave women out of it. Take it. 
I don't see this as a loss for women like some woman lost her job to this guy or something. Because women have been subjected to this gross sexualization for too long. So good. Take the bikini pics, you can have them. Take the beauty pageants, take the Victoria's Secret catalog. You can have it all, we don't want it. That was my gut reaction. I am so disgusted by the continual pornified portrayals of women in the media that are so normalized and ubiquitous that we don't even think about it. We take it for granted that above all, a woman's role in our society is to look sexy. Even when she is doing something empowering, a woman's looks are commented on. We scrutinize a female politician's appearance alongside her politics. A female scientist looks alongside her discoveries. A female artist's sexiness alongside her artwork. Men are not subjected to these expectations and this pressure to anywhere near the same degree. And the reason we have these expectations is because we have been conditioned as a society and as individuals through years of exposure to things like the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition to see women as objects whose primary value to the world is our beauty. So what really does it mean for women to have men now on both sides of the camera, both producing and consuming this softcore pornography? The gazer and the gazed upon. Is this a step towards women's liberation? Do we get to just wash our hands of this whole thing and say, yes, please take it. We don't want it. It's done us enough damage. Do we encourage more men to take these roles so that it becomes the norm to have your average Joe pick up a magazine and lust after your maybe not so average Timothy? Is this really better for women? The answer, of course, is no. Because a man posing on the cover of this magazine is still reinforcing the standards of stereotypical feminine beauty that all women are then subjected to. You have a man who, within the dynamics of sexism, is a member of the oppressor class, now playing a new role in women's oppression. And this actually creates a new level of unachievable beauty standards, right? Until now, the imagery in popular media that the average woman has had to compare herself to has been of women who are professional models with personal trainers and crazy diets and yet still have plastic surgery, breast augmentation, liposuction, fat injections, lip injections. They are heavily made up. They have fake tans, hair extensions, manicures. They're shaved and waxed and lasered to oblivion. Uh, with professional lighting, professional photography, fantastic locations, and beautiful, expensive clothes. But even if the average woman were to bend her whole life around trying to achieve that look, which is supposed to be effortless, by the way, she never could because there's also Photoshop and airbrushing. Literally no human being on planet Earth actually looks like the images you see in magazines. But now the standard has gone one step further in that on top of all of those other things, now a male body is included in the list of what it takes to be the ultimate sex object that society demands women strive towards being. So this is no step forward for women. But let's take a moment and listen to what Lena Bloom says about what he thinks this accomplishment means. The caption to his Instagram post of this photo reads, this moment heals a lot of pain in the world. Now, please tell me if I'm being too callous here, but we're talking about a photo of a man in a swimsuit. And I think that comes off as pretty grandiose and possibly delusional. There are many moments that have healed pain in the world. The end of World War II, the development of the polio vaccine, the end of apartheid, I mean, we're in the middle of a global pandemic right now, and Lena is talking about how some bikini photos are healing the world. I don't know. I hope my cover empowers those who are struggling to be seen to feel valued. 
Your cover reinforces the idea that a woman's value is in her looks, since you yourself are teetering on that cliff above the uncanny valley, appropriating the approximate appearance of a hypersexualized woman. I dedicate this cover to all ballroom femme queens, past, present, and future. Now look, I've seen Paris is burning many times, and I get that Lena is invoking the gay male outcasts of the past who did suffer from violence, discrimination, AIDS, drug use, mental illness. And those men created a subculture around hyperfemininity and female appropriation as a coping mechanism. Criticisms of drag aside, kind of a whole other topic, I do believe it's important for people to not feel like outcasts and especially to not be subjected to violence just for being themselves and living their lives and being in their bodies. And it's important for people to be able to navigate the world not in fear, but truly feeling empowered. And the way that I know that is because I navigate the world as a woman and I feel that fear and I have experienced that violence. And sexualized imagery of women or hyperfeminine men actually heightens the fear and violence that I and all women experience because it reinforces the idea that women are subhuman objects whose value is in the pleasure derived from their use. And when they are not useful because they lack beauty or sex appeal, those objects can be discarded. So instead of empowering anyone, including himself, Lena has contributed to the disempowerment of all women, and for that matter, feminine men as well. Sexual objectification is a problem to which Lena has directly contributed. Finally, Lena writes, if you are willing to pay attention to the lessons, trust your positive instincts, and not be afraid to take risks, the possibilities are infinite. Well, that I do agree with. I'll see you guys next time.